Hi guys, this is GSNO.com and I'm here with the Realme GT3, the fastest charging phone on the planet, a 240 watts charge. It has a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 powerful processor inside and the main camera of the OnePlus 11 and OnePlus Nord 3. The price should be around 500 euros and it runs on Android 13 with the Realme UI 4.0 on top. It also has a special rectangle here which lights up in a special GT mode for gamers. So let's get straight to it. The colors in which the device is available in are white and black and the white one has a combo of black and white on account of the elegant camera area which is quite flat and doesn't protrude. This is the rectangle which lights up and I'm going to show you in a minute. And just so you know, um, we have a glass at the back side as a material, glass at the front side to plastic protection, but the frame somehow is uh, well uh, made of plastic. This is the special option here, we can see that it lights up. I can set it to green for example, it can strobe, it can light like this, it can stay lit, it can be off, or it can twinkle, you can set the speed of its glitter and so much more. Okay, that's about it. So plastic frame and if you want measurements, 8.9 millimeters in thickness and a decent 199 grams. It's quite well built but it's also pretty wide and long so one hand use won't be easy. It's also rather slippery, even though the curved sides at the back sides should help with your, well, grip. Okay, a, a pretty nice build, but definitely try and buy a case, a case or otherwise you're going to drop it. And sadly, we also do not have an IP certification available here. As far as the screen is concerned, it's an AMOLED, 6.74 inches. The resolution is around Full HD+, plus, up to 1400 nits of brightness and 144 hertz refresh rate. Shows 1 billion colors and has HDR10 plus support. The screen protection is applied, it's a plastic one. And the bezels are, as you can see, quite symmetrical. Now when it comes to the viewing experience, we have our usual test clip here. And here we are. It's quite an immersive panel with a high refresh rate, deep blacks, white color palette and solid contrast. It's bright and crisp and has wide view angles. So not much to object about and uh, we go further here and see the brightness level we achieved in our tests. So we achieved 803 lux units. Let's just turn down the brightness a little bit. So 803 lux units, which means that the phone is actually superior to the Honor 90 and also the Realme GT Neo 3 150 watts, sort of its, well, predecessor. It's below the Nothing Phone 2, Motorola H40 and Huawei Nova 11 Pro. Now going further, uh, we're going to talk about the CPU inside the phone, which is a pretty familiar one, on account of the fact that one year ago it was present on most later year flagships. Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. Um, it's available on the likes of the Xiaomi 12T Pro, OnePlus 10T, just two examples. It's accompanied here in the current case by, let's see, 16 gigs of LPDDR5X RAM and 256GB of storage, UFS 3.1. There's no microSD, also no lag, no overheating and it can definitely, definitely run any game. We also did a throttling test and let's see what happened there. This is the CPU throttle test and as you can see, it throttled to 89% of its max performance, so it only lost 11% power. Now, going back to our sister site tests, we have here Antutu 10, where we scored on the 8th spot, beating the likes of the Nothing Phone 2, OnePlus Open and several other phones, like the Pixel 8 Pro for example. We scored below the iPhone 15 and the Xiaomi 13T Pro. Now when it comes to Geekbench 6 multi-core, we're just above the Motorola H40 and Xiaomi 13T Pro, um, and at the same time below the Nothing Phone 2 and the Xiaomi 13 Pro. There are also GPU benchmarks to be done, like a 3D Mark uh, Wildlife Unlimited, where we just surpassed the OnePlus 10T with a similar processor and the Xiaomi 12T Pro. We scored below, let's see here, the Huawei P60 Pro, iPhone 14 Pro and Motorola H40 Pro. So overall a similar result to what you saw on the later part of 2022 flagships. The temperature is also tested by us, you can see here, we achieved 38.5 degrees Celsius in benchmarks. Not the worst, but also not the best, decent and I would say I felt some heating from this phone. Now the battery is pretty important here, is the selling point, 4600 mAh, but what matters the most is that it has a 240 watt wired charging 
meaning it can reach 50% charge in 4 minutes or a full charge in just 10 minutes. Uh, we have the bundle charger, 240 watts, but we don't have a special cable for it, so it may have influenced our results we achieved in our tests. When it comes to the video playback test, we achieved a sufficient 20 hours and 33 minutes, uh, which beats the Samsung Galaxy A54, iPhone 15 and the Huawei Nova 11 Pro. We scored below the Honor 90, OnePlus 10T and nothing Phone 2. Now, at the same time, we have continuous usage, which is quite good, 13 hours and 7 minutes. I mean, it's superior to the OnePlus 11 and Pixel 8 Pro, but at the same time, uh, um, inferior to the Realme GT Neo 3 150 watts, the predecessor, and the Vivo V23 5G. The charging wasn't as expected, it's 45 minutes for a full charge, but once again, we didn't have the official cable USB-C for this potent charger. After 15 minutes, we are at 33% and after 30 minutes, 74%, but I'm definitely sure, seeing other tests of the phone, that you can achieve the promised 10 minutes charge for a full charge. When it comes to acoustics, we have one speaker at the bottom and the one at the top is the earpiece here. Uh, we don't have an audio jack, just in case you were wondering. And the experience goes something like this. By the way, in the settings, you're going to find stuff like Dolby Atmos, um, gaming features, spatial audio and advanced haptics. So here we go. Okay, so um, if you're listening to heavy metal, things will get very distorted at the top volume. By the way, it's a loud set of speakers with a pretty decent bass and nice highs. The voices are pretty clear, but beware of heavy metal and beware of intense songs which tend to create distortion. So the top volume may be high, but there's also a bit of distortion going on. When it comes to the decibel tests, we have them here. We achieved 79 decibels at the top speaker with an acoustic sample, 87.7 decibels at the bottom. It surpasses Motorola H40 and Redmi Note 12 Pro, but it's below the Nokia X35 G and Realme uh, C55. When it comes to gaming, we have a decent 99.3 decibels, superior to the Redmi Note 12 Pro and the Vivo X80 Pro, inferior to the Motorola G84 and also the OnePlus 10T. And finally, we can talk about the camera. You can see here that we have a cutout of the top of the screen and this cutout is for a selfie shooter, a 16 megapixel selfie shooter with f2.5 aperture and full HD capture. Going to the back side things get interesting because we have a main 50 megapixel camera with a Sony IMX A90 sensor. We saw it on the OnePlus 11 and the OnePlus Nord T. Optical stabilization and phased action autofocus and f1.9 aperture. Then there is an ultra wide 8 megapixel camera with 112 degree capture and a 2 megapixel microscope camera, yes, they're still doing that, plus a dual tone, dual LED flash. Uh, 4K 60 frames per second capture is available and the camera interface includes quite a few features. You can find them here. These are the special modes. And as you can see, we have a microscope, which also lights up the flash and will show me my skin hair and uh, well, skin in great detail. You can see the tegumentos of the skin can go up to 40x magnification. This is actually my skin you're seeing here. So that's what the microscope can do, among others. Okay, so I'll skip straight to the gallery. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a winter holiday here in Romania, in a mountainous town called Brasov in Transylvania, and these are the pictures I've taken. I have to admit, not a bad main camera, and also not a bad ultra-wide camera, seeing how it's only 8 megapixels. I mean, yes, uh, the details are not the most impressive in the world, but the reds, the blues and the colors of the sky are fine. I was generally quite impressed with the behavior of the camera. Of course, zoom is not much to write home about on account of it only being digital. And uh, what did really impress me is the focus on the close-ups. By the way, this is the plant and these are the microscope shots of the plant. And once again, close-ups aren't very close, you will not get really in-depth with macro shots, but uh, remotely close close-ups are quite decent. Architectural shots are fine, so this is the main camera, and this is the ultra-wide camera. The colors are a bit more pale compared to the main camera, but it's not something serious. I was actually, once again, impressed by the level of detail of the main sensor and the quality of the shots. It's a pretty pragmatic camera, it doesn't overblow color, doesn't make them cold, I would actually say it's a tendency towards coldness and uh, accurate colors rather than overblown ones. So yeah, pretty impressive main camera and a decent ultra-wide camera above expectations for a 2 megapixel shooter. 
I also took some selfies, not exactly mind blown by them, but the bokeh is correctly applied from all the people behind me. And you will not see my pores and some of the selfies are too well lit, so to say, too white. They're pretty expressive, there's a decent level of detail, but once again, I feel I've seen better on other mid-range phones, where at least the bokeh is fine. We also have some food photos. I mean, they're fine, but it's not exactly a flagship level. You should try to stay not as close to the subject, so food macros won't be available. You have to at least leave five centimeters to the subject. The texture is fine, as you can see here for yourself, but the lighting will definitely influence the whole experience. We have several more daytime shots here. We even caught a rose in December, which is odd. So yeah, lots of details and a pretty nice focus here. That's what I can say. And another batch of selfies confirming it's just a decent 60 megapixel camera, nothing to write home about. I would say that overall, it's the equal of the OnePlus Nord 3. It can fight a nothing phone too, and uh, it's above the Motorola Edge 40. Now let's talk about the night mode pics because we have plenty in the same town and I have to say this time it's where the ultra wide camera shows its vulnerability, things get a bit muddy and murky, the details fade away and the street lights are a bit big, however the main camera is quite solid. One thing I didn't quite notice is the involvement of the night mode, I mean it's there, you're using it but you don't exactly feel it like you did on other phones. The photos look quite amazing when it comes to the uh, low light capture. Particularly the colors of the main camera are very satisfying, even though it's nighttime. Less so on the ultra wide camera, which feels a bit more washed out. So yes, the night mode capture is not very present, but at the same time, do we actually need it? I mean, we can take beautiful scenery shots like this. You can post them on social media. The street lights halos aren't exaggeratedly big, and you'll definitely make an impressions with captures like this one here, or this one, or a variety of shots of trees, buildings, and so forth. So definitely you can take memorable shots, but beware of the ultra wide camera in the night mode. I was actually underwhelmed by the selfie camera at night, even though if you activate the camera flash, so to say, uh, the screen used as a flash, you'll be more happy with the results achieved. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Overall a satisfying experience photo-wise, and I think it's time to address the videos using this player here. Okay, so these are the videos I've taken. Let's turn down the volume a bit. This is a test of focus. Focusing on the foreground and the background, alternating between them, happens in a very fast and efficient manner. At the same time, we also have a stabilization test. 4K 30 frames per second, descending a pretty steep street. The stabilization handles the scenario. I don't see any shakiness, vibration of the image, or detail loss, so that's fine. Okay, selfie videos, we have two of them. One is without stabilization and one is with stabilization. This is the stabilized one. It's good enough for vlogging, I would say. I'm actually more impressed by the quality of the video of the selfies rather than the photos. Okay, actually, let's go back here. And uh, we have this video here, it's a panning clip. You can start to see the golden hour close to the sunset. Excellent details, colors and clarity, moving subjects galore, but zero problems. So the quality of the OnePlus Nord 3 and OnePlus 11 is definitely felt here on account of the excellent main sensor. Okay, I think we have enough here. These are daytime shots, I'm quite impressed. The zoom is underwhelming, but a weird thing here is the fact that the night video didn't quite deliver on par with the daytime videos. I mean, the street lights are a bit overblown, there are some extra reflections, a bit of noise here and there and uh, even some overblown lights with overblown colors. That's a rare occurrence though, because some of the other videos are actually satisfying. For a night video, this is actually a pretty memorable and impressive one, but only beware of the two strong light sources. Aside from that, I actually have no objections, and I'm pretty presently impressed by what this camera can deliver. Now, I think we have to cover other subjects because we're done with the camera, and we can definitely discuss, well, connectivity. It's a 5G phone with Wi-Fi 6 support. <laughs> it also has an infrared emitter here at the top side, so you can control a TV set. USB-C 2.0 port at the bottom side, Bluetooth 5.3, GPS dual band, and a strange kind of NFC, dual side, front and back, for your NFC contactless payment needs. The calls were pretty loud and clear in my book, 
I'm talking about clarity and quality, and the speeds were fine. 5G got us up to 585 mega per second downloads and 35.1 mega per second uploads, while Wi Fi was at about 733 over 826 mega per second downloads and uploads, respectively. Software wise, this is Android 13 with Realme UI 4.0 on top. We have a fast fingerprint scanner here embedded in the screen, but I actually opted for face unlock because, well, it's even faster. This is the news feed to the leftmost area, this is the recent area. And for multitasking, you also have the sidebar where you can trigger floating apps on the screen. This is the quick settings and notifications area, which is quite minimalistic. And if you swipe down like this, you have the shelf borrowed from OnePlus, a collection of useful widgets. Now, aside from that, uh, we do have some special features like the GT mode uh, I mentioned earlier, and also the special features area, split screen, flexible windows, quick launch, smart sidebar, kit space, and simple mode. Gamers have their own option here, and before that, there's a phone manager with lots of tool, tools excuse me, that help the functioning of the device and help it stay stable. As I said before, there's something for gamers. It's the game toolkit here with frame rate, quick start, management of games, profiles, and so much more. And for the vibration even. Okay, um, let's see if I forgot anything. So, cover special features, um, GT mode. And uh, let's see the apps we have pre-installed actually, but before that, you can see the customization happens via wallpapers, icons, widgets, layout, transitions, and more. You can tweak clock styles, by the way. As far as the pre-installed apps go, we have the phone manager, we have the games app, we have the special app market, we have a booking.com, there's also Facebook pre-installed, Genshin Impact for some reason, Joom, uh, some ice cream things, LinkedIn, a music player, my files, notes if you want to take notes, and a Zen Space application. I think we're about done with the review here, and I think it's time for the verdict. Now, the handset you're seeing here is definitely good for traveling because I actually travel with it. On the pro side, we have a bright screen which is very crisp, good performance, the fastest charging on the market, 10 minutes should be enough juice for one day, and uh, an excellent main camera. We have a surprisingly good video quality for the price you're paying, and I'm talking about video capture, fast connectivity and enough battery life for travelers. Customizable UI and uh, that's pretty much it as far as the pros are concerned. On the con side, I have to mention the fact that there are some gimmicks. Um, the microscope feels like a gimmick. We don't have IP certification, do not have micro SD. It's a slippery phone without a case. And the ultra wide camera is a letdown, especially during the night time, but it's okay during the day. We have a plastic frame and also um, some distortion at top volume for the speakers. And the night mode is not exactly felt when applied. The selfie camera is a mixed bag. That's what I can say as well. So Realme GT3, fastest charging phone on the market, excellent for gaming, and probably the best filming for below $600, which you can get. Definitely a rival for nothing phone 2, OnePlus Nord 3, and um, Honor, no, excuse me, uh, Huawei Nova 11 Pro. I would say it's good for travelers who are always on the run, and it's also good for gamers. So yeah, there you have it. It has the fast 5G, the fast charging, and also the solid main camera of the OnePlus 11. That's it from us. We'll be back with more soon. Hope you enjoyed the review of the Realme GT3 and its 240 watt charging. Goodbye.